Hello everyone and welcome to the National Army Museum for our special behind the scenes tour of our Photo Friend exhibition. Today we're going to walk around and look at some of the key objects we've got relating to the Cold War, this really significant period of the Army's time in Germany where they stood on that front line in the Cold War ideological confrontation between the West and the Soviet Union. Now, for the army, this was a major defining period about why they were in Germany, it kept them in Germany for a long time after winning the peace in 1945, and it would keep them there for the decades afterwards. It's incredibly significant, not only with the great objects we've got here, but the incredible stories we tell as well. And we're going to have a lot of fun as we walk around. In the aftermath of the Second World War in Europe, in May 1945, the victorious allies, France, Britain, the United States and the Soviet Union, were presented with a challenge about how they were going to rebuild Germany how they were going to secure their own country's future and prevent Germany from ever rising again and threatening European and world peace. In July 1945, the victorious allies agreed to divide Germany between them to each take a zone of occupation. This would also be re replicated in Berlin, which was actually deep inside the Russian zone. You can see from this map here the different ways in which Germany would be divided up. However, this created some potential future tensions. Each of the different nations had a different idea about just how Germany should be governed in the aftermath, just how much they should be punished in the aftermath of the war. But for the British, for their zone of occupation, this is where life was going to be centred for the next decades, as they looked to both occupy Germany, but also to the threats that were to come. In 1948, those ideological differences between the victorious powers that had been put to one side while they fought and defeated Nazi Germany came back to the surface and the first overtly hostile act of the Cold War really began. The setting for that was Berlin, and the Soviet Union exploited Berlin's position deep inside the Soviet zone of occupation of Germany to essentially cut the city off from the outside. They blockaded the roads, they blockaded the rail, they even blockaded the canals. This was designed to test the Allied resolve, to see how willing they'd be to actually stand up to the Soviets in Germany. How far would they go to protect the Germans, the people who had been their enemies only a few years before? Now, the Berlin airlift that was decided upon by the Allies was going to be this major response. They were going to keep this city supplied by air. It was a phenomenal effort by the British, by the French and by the Americans. So much so that at its peak, it ran for, you know, throughout 1948 into 1949. And at its peak, there was a plane landing every 60 seconds at one of Berlin's three airports. They were even landing flying boats on the Havel on the lakes, all of which was bringing supplies in, you know, bringing fuel in, bringing food, bringing ammunition in in case it was needed but also they were taking Berliners out for, you know, if they needed hospital treatment or that sort of thing as well. And the Berlin airlift is significant for many reasons. Yes, it's that crisis point and that sees the Cold War enter a new phase of confrontation, but also on the flip side, you see it as a new point in the relationship between the British and their German neighbours. Suddenly they're protecting the Germans, suddenly they're standing with the Germans against Soviet expansion. And already those previous relationships, those previous sense of being an enemy are starting to shift uh, and a new path is beginning to be made. Throughout the British time in Cold War Germany, there was one place in particular that everybody wanted to serve that was always seen as being the most exciting, and that was Berlin. And undoubtedly in the Cold War, the eyes of the world were on Berlin. You know, this was where the real confrontation between East and West was taking place. And for the British who were there, the British Berlin Infantry Brigade, but also all the families that were serving there with them, it was an incredibly exciting time. Berlin's position deep inside Soviet territory made it exciting, but also potentially dangerous. Had the Cold War turned hot, there was little doubt about what would have happened. For those stationed with the Berlin Infantry Brigade or, or the, the family members of those soldiers, they wore the, the patch of Berlin here. As you can see, the, the red ring going round the black circle. Then legend has it that was to denote the Soviets encircling the city and creating this unique atmosphere of Cold War Germany. There was certainly a sense of, of tenseness about it, that you, you were something of a sharp end. I don't think we really thought there was a very high chance of deterrence failing uh, at the time that I was in Berlin, but that didn't stop the feeling of tenseness. You know, there was a wall around you and people were being shot trying to escape from it. When we talk about the Cold War in Germany, we often talk about the Iron Curtain, this barrier that separated the capitalist and free West from the Soviet controlled East. And the Berlin Wall is a manifestation of that. It is that barrier made real. In 1961, it was created, it cut the city of Berlin in half. The Western sectors were cut off, the Eastern sectors were preserved. And for the British soldiers who were in West Berlin at the time, it suddenly made Berlin a much more dangerous and yet interesting place. 
And in the decades that followed for the soldiers and their families that came through and served there, the Berlin Wall had a particular resonance. It was always there, it loomed large, it ran right up against the walls of some of the barracks. The British had to patrol it, they had to guard it, and yet at the same time it was this incredible symbol of being so close to the Soviet enemy, the reason why they were in Germany in the first place. This was them up close and up personal with the Soviets and the communists. And yet the British could also pass through the wall, they could go through Checkpoint Charlie, they could go into the east. Their favourable exchange rate meant they had enormous purchasing power in the restaurants, they could go to the opera. They did all of these wonderful things that made Berlin this fantastic, vibrant city and a fascinating part of the British deployment to Germany during the Cold War. One of the unique things created by the division of Germany and the deepening Cold War were these special units the British had in Germany. They had nowhere else that were really unparalleled in British Army history. I think one of those was almost certainly the British Commander-in-Chief's mission to the Soviet Western Group of Forces, or better known by the acronym BRICSMIS. Originally, they'd been created to act as a liaison organisation to facilitate the good governance of Berlin between the, the, the British and the Soviet Union. But as the Cold War deepened, as the ideological battle got, grew harder, suddenly they were presented with a unique opportunity. They could go behind the walls and the wire of East Germany. They could gather intelligence on what the Soviets had. As the Soviets amassed more and more forces and the attack on West Germany that seemed to become more and more likely, Bricksmiths were ideally placed to gather intelligence, to uncover what Soviet intentions were, what their capabilities were, and they could pass that back to the UK. They were a unique unit at a unique time and they used some pretty specialist pieces of kit, much like this car behind me. This Opel Senator saloon car was specially modified with additional fuel tanks. It was painted matte so it wouldn't be reflective in the dark. They created curtains in the back so they could hide a bit better and hide their recording equipment. And it had modified suspension so it could really go cross country and go anywhere to try and uncover where the Soviet forces were training and what kit they might be using in it. Bricksmiths was a very specialised unit. It was very small. It was located in the British headquarters in the old Olympic Stadium in West Berlin. But they also had an operating base in Potsdam in East Germany as well. And their main function was to go out for days at a time and gather as much intelligence as they could on the Soviets. They had some specialist equipment to do that, they had a lot of surveillance equipment, but the most important pieces of kit they carried was the food necessary to last out in the field for three days, a tent, a dictaphone and a camera so they could capture everything and pass it back for deeper intelligence analysis. They got some pretty wild and, uh, and interesting things throughout their time. I mean, most notably, as we display here in the exhibition, was Sergeant Anthony Hoare and what he did is a member of Bricksmith's touring party in 1981 he and his group broke into a Soviet gunnery range and he and his tour officer climbed inside a T-64 tank and began to take pictures and record information about what they saw building up an ideal picture about the Soviet capability of this main battle tank. For his efforts he was awarded the British Empire Medal and we actually display his medals for the first time in public here in the exhibition. For the British Army in Germany during the Cold War, life was about training. Training for the confrontation with the Soviet Union that they thought was coming. It was not a question of if, it was a question of when. And increasingly, from the 1950s onwards, the nuclear element impeded in that. Suddenly British soldiers had to be prepared to fight not only a war, but the war, a nuclear war, a devastating conflict on the plains of northern Germany, and very few of them thought they'd ever survive. Nuclear-issued kits such as this was designed to help them fight for as long as possible, but realistically, many of the soldiers knew that it would do little if the battle should go nuclear. For the British soldiers training in this environment, training in the shadow of nuclear war, there were new skills to master. Suddenly they had to be prepared to don protective equipment such as this behind me, in particular the respirator as well, should nuclear war begin. There was an instruction booklet, Survive to Fight, which designed and detailed all of the different drills and procedures they'd have to take to protect themselves, to repair their suits if they were damaged, even to go to the toilet in their suits. It really was a different world, but it was a major part of what life was like. There'd be whole headquarters who would spend hours wearing their respirators just to practice getting used to them. Soldiers would play sport in them to practice getting used to them. All of which because they knew that this could potentially save their life. And yet, at the same time, throughout that, there was this recognition that if the war went nuclear, and the assumption was it probably would, very few of them, and very few of their families who were living behind them as well in the bases, would actually survive. The assessment was we had about 30 minutes and we'd be dead. You, you know, so you were, hot, you were 
hot as you could be on your NBC drills, you lived in the damn stuff, it was awful, especially in summer, not too bad in winter. Summer was absolutely dog awful. The British were outnumbered by about three to one by the Soviet forces, and they recognised that really the only way they could achieve victory, and they believed they could achieve victory, was through training and mastery of arms and skill at weaponry. Logistics would be really important as well, tactical manoeuvrability, but all built upon the ability to use their kit effectively. We've got some of the weapons behind me here, and the British moved through several evolutions of their weapons that they trained with. At the lowest level, it was about marksmanship, and then it built up to using the more complex kit, bridge lane equipment, tanks, all of that sort of thing as well. Several icons of the period emerged from this. You know, the, the, the SLR, for example, the self-loading rifle, became an icon of the British Army in the Cold War. You will never see an image of a British soldier in Germany without an SLR. And when it was replaced towards the end of the Cold War by the SA-80, there was huge outcry from the soldiers and from the Cold War warriors who were so familiar with this weapon and believed in its value and its strength so much as well. For them, this was going to be how they were going to defeat the Soviets when they attacked. There was what was called a ritual dance of deterrence about how the British approached training throughout the year in Cold War Germany. They would start with small-scale unit exercises and then gradually build up larger and larger until every autumn they'd carry out what was called a field training exercise. This saw thousands of troops battle across northwest Germany in mock simulation of combat. The largest of these field training exercises was called Exercise Lionheart, which was held in the autumn of 1984. It saw 131,000 British soldiers battle their way across the British zone of northwest Germany. These were soldiers based both in Germany, in, in the garrisons there, but also thousands brought over from the UK to simulate how they would reinforce the battle zone for when the Soviets attacked. It was absolutely enormous and it defined an era. It cost £100 million in today's money and it's the largest exercise the army's ever done. The British Army was victorious in the Cold War. Decades of vigilance, of active deterrence, of ruthless professionalism had seen victory achieved. Yet in the aftermath of this, severe questions were being asked about what the army was for. If it was no longer going to fight the Soviets in Germany, why should it be kept there in such large numbers? What was next for the British Army? That's perhaps a subject for another tour, but when we look at what happens to the British Army of the Rhine in the aftermath of the collapse of the Soviet Union, we can see it's a period of enormous change both in terms of size, because it's cut in by about half in terms of numbers in Germany, but also in terms of role and function, because increasingly it's deployed out of area, out of operations, overseas. They go to the Gulf, they go to the Balkans, they go to Afghanistan. Yet for the army itself, what it had accomplished in the Cold War can't really be overstated. And one BR Corps, which had been the main fighting component of the British Army of the Rhine, of whom this flag belongs to, had stood there throughout. The Germans recognised this, the Germans acknowledged this, and they presented 1BR Corps with this ribbon. It's called a Fahnenband. It's the highest honour that could be bestowed by the German federal government on a military unit. And this recognises the friendship that existed between the British Army and Germany in 1993 when it was handed over and it was given, which is incredible when you think about where that relationship had begun in 1945. The Cold War remade that relationship between the British Army and Germany, and it's created a legacy that we see today. If you're interested and you'd like to learn more, there's going to be plenty of information on the museum's website, either in long-form articles or an online collection where you can unpack more detail about these fascinating stories and these wonderful objects. Our public programme is also going to have lots of events connected to the theme of the army in Germany as well, so lots more coming up for us to explore more of this fascinating story. We really hope we can see you in the museum soon, but until then, goodbye.
Hello, everybody, and I hope you enjoyed watching the second in our series of virtual guided tours of our Foe to Friend exhibition. Um, I'm joined by Dr. Peter Johnson, the lead curator of this exhibition and the head of research here at the National Army Museum. Today's tour has gone out across a number of platforms and we have collated your questions and Peter has agreed to answer them. So thanks for giving up your time, Peter. We'll try and get through as many as we can in the time that we have. So do keep them coming through. Um, if you're on Crowdcast, pop them in the ask a question box. And if you're on um, YouTube or Facebook, do just pop them in the chat on there. But Peter, I just wanted to kick things off to start with and just ask you how important was the army during the Cold War? I mean, I think it's a really important question. And actually, it's something that when you think about how the Cold War is studied, uh, how we, we talk about it, then what the army in Germany does is, is, you know, often neglected. You know, people talk about divided Berlin. Uh, but normally, when we talk about the Cold War, we talk about things like the Cuban Missile Crisis or Vietnam and domino theory uh, and that sort of stuff. We don't tend to talk about how Britain's role in, in this. And, you know, the, the, the Cold War in Germany was, was Britain's front line. You know, this was the place where they actually faced off against the Soviets directly um, and didn't fight through proxies or anything like that. Um, this was the place where if the battle was going to be fought and you know, there was an expectation it would be, this is where it was going to be fought and won uh, mm -hmm. in, in North Germany. So it was absolutely vital and it completely consumed what the army was about. You know, all of the doctrine that was developed was about fighting the Soviets, all of the kit the huge amount of technical innovation that goes into this, you know, tank design rapidly evolves, you know, the, the, some of the, well, some of the kit the army still uses now was designed to be used against the Soviets in Germany. Mm. Um, and yeah, it's quite useful. With, uh, it turns out it's quite useful if you use it elsewhere too, but this is where this, the, the drive of, of all sorts of technological innovation, um, medical innovation, everything was uh, doctrinally training, everything was taking place here in Germany. And it was, it was the center and soul of the British army. Yeah, completely. Um, so I suppose following on from that, how likely did people think that the Cold War would turn hot? So I think there's there's sort of several key phases of of of, of this. Um, first of all, people sort of understand about what the Cold War is really develops pretty much from sort of 1948 onwards, particularly after the Berlin airlift. You know, that at, at, at this point, or rather the Berlin blockade and the subsequent airlift, at this point, you know, there's an understanding that the Soviets are not going to be particularly friendly and they are actually quite hostile. And there's, this is what the army are going to have to radically reorientate itself to, to do. And suddenly fighting communism um, by manifestation, the Soviets it, are, are communism, uh, is, is what the army is suddenly going to be for. So you have the Cold War expectation and then you have the ramping up of the exercises. But all the time, you know, the soldiers are really looking across the inner German border, particularly as it's increasingly fortified. And they understand that, you know, if the, Soviet, the Soviets have all the necessary manpower that they need to attack, they have all the heavy kit. It's there in Germany. It's looking at them. <laughs> in the case of uh, RF Gatau, which was the airport in, in West Berlin, um, you, you can literally see it through a chain link fence on the other side of the runway. You can literally just see it lined up there. Um, and, and so you have all this posture. And so for a long time, you know, there was this understanding that the Cold War, it was going to happen. It wasn't a question of if, it was a question of when. Um, and from the, through the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, that's very much part and parcel uh, of, of the expectation um, and, and what you expect to see. Um, it begins to sort of ebb away. I think, you know, the longer that you have deterrence in action, the longer that you have this idea about these forces facing off, but no actual direct confrontation taking place in Germany, it begins to erode this idea that perhaps the fighting will take place. And yet at the same time, it's exactly what everyone trains to do. It completely dominates people's lives. So whilst emotionally they might not think it's going to happen, professionally they're exactly, they think it is going to happen. It dedicates their training because you can't ever prepare. You can't say this is the main threat and this is what we're going to train for, but it's probably not going to happen because mm -hmm. that completely erodes your effectiveness as a fighting force. And I think that's actually what makes, you know, that's what made the army such an effective unit in Germany it's what made it so good it's what made it a better army it had this complete unity of purpose um, and whilst you know individuals probably said well it's never going to happen it, you know we're never going to fight a, a war here you know culturally that's exactly what everything was about and everyone bought into that and everyone did what was necessary to make themselves the best they could be to actually fight that war should they need to it is the example of, of deterrence and action it's what made the army so effective and then when the army was actually was actually called upon to use all those skills and training 
that they put into they they worked so hard and spent so much time in perfected. It just happened to be in the Persian Gulf, uh, a few thousand miles away. But it's the army in Germany that goes off to fight that. And you know, yeah. actually, if you, and if everyone logs in tomorrow, yeah, uh, for our Friday Insight, you'll be able to hear um, you know Lieutenant Colonel Tim Perbrick, who was based in Germany, talk about this exact thing. So uh, I mean, yeah, come 30, back. 30 years on, exactly. I mean. Come back, come back tomorrow and hear that as well, you know. Tomorrow at 12. Um, and a question that's come in that does follow on quite nicely from that is um, a lady said, I've heard that the British Army soldiers were often keen to serve in West Berlin and that it was often an exciting posting surrounded by Soviet-controlled territory. But from what you've, you've said is it was considered to be a quite a dangerous posting too because of the threat of nuclear attack. Were some of the families perhaps less keen about being posted or were there mixed feelings? Really great question. It is a great question. It is a great question. I think the after the Berlin Wall goes up in particular, um, you, uh, it, you know, it, it, it creates this level of, of frisson of tension. You know, there's quite literally, you know, Churchill's Iron Curtain made real. Um, you, you, you've got this sense of, well, that, that there are the bad guys on the other side of that wall. We are ultimately literally you know, we're cut off and, and walled in because uh, you know the, the the berlin wall didn't just run between british west uh, west berlin and, and 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 east berlin it ran around the whole of the western sectors as well um and so you know it, there was this sort of sense and this tension and this idea that i wouldn't say it sense fatalism but there was this idea that if things if the balloon did go up then they'd be wiped out pretty quickly um there was an exercise designed to get a brigade up the autobahn uh, mm. to, to Berlin to relieve them called Live Oak that um, they the NATO continuously practiced, but it was never going to work. Um, and I think people recognize that. Um, and yet at the same time, so there was that and there was the impending sense. And so at some of the real flashpoints and tensions of the Cold War being in Berlin felt very, very isolated. You know, there was obviously there was the, 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 the Berlin um, riots in the, uh, uh, in the 50s uh, against uh, this sort of thing. There was when the wall itself went up yeah. Um, there was obviously the, the, the famous standoff we've all seen pictures of at Checkpoint Charlie yeah. the, the Hungarian um, uprising as well uh, Prague, uh, 68 all of these things um, sort of. whenever there was a, a flashpoint in the Cold War somewhere it manifested itself in increased tensions in Berlin so that sort of uh, in, in, increased the sense of isolation um, and threat and yet at the same time what you got in Berlin was this incredibly rewarding professional experience and this wonderful life you couldn't get anywhere else so it was absolutely mm. unique in that regard. And people liked it. Soldiers really wanted to go there. Their families had good facilities. Um, I think on the, on the whole, it was, it was probably a single man. It was a single soldier's posting uh, for what you used to be able to get up to, particularly in some of the uh, less reputable parts of Charlottenburg. Uh, but, um, and I don't know if anyone in the chat will, well, no, probably no one will admit to some of that. Uh, but this was, it was also a great place for families to be because the housing was really good. The facilities were really good. You know, it's part of the project. I spoke to people who, yeah. you know, they took their kids swimming in an Olympic swimming pool uh, every day, uh, all paid for by the West Berliners. Um, uh, and, you know, it sort of the wall almost became a little bit of just a backdrop to life um, in this incredibly dynamic, uh, unique place in the world. I think one of the things that I've always found so fascinating about this period and particularly this video when we started to work on it as well, it's all about Bricksmiths. And, you know, one of the questions that I have is how popular um, was Bricksmiths as a posting? So, uh, Bricksmiths itself, I mean, it's, it was a tiny, tiny group of people, really. Um, and, and actually, you know, and, and again, this is sort of something that is quite keen to me now that, that for a while that whilst they're in Bricksmiths, they're technically not part of the British army. Technically mm. they're on the staff of the Soviets, which is in itself a relatively interesting thing in the Cold War. Um, but it was a really popular posting because it was seen as being incredibly exciting because you could just do things there that you just couldn't do anywhere else. Mm. You had to go through, you had to do a, a lot of, there was obviously a lot of language training and skills and everything to before people could be posted there. But you had the opportunity to, to well, to be based um, uh, in, in both in Berlin, but also in East Germany, you know, to, to be able to travel behind the Iron Curtain, to go around, to actually see the enemy up close. You know, soldiers, are, I think, are inherently risk takers uh, mm. anyway. Um, but professionally, it became incredibly rewarding, um, as well as obviously the opportunity to see all these different places that you simply couldn't get to. And people used to, you know, really, really try and hunt down one of these postings. They worked really hard to get into it. Um, obviously, there were certain cat badges that were always required. Um, there was always an RAF presence to fly the aerial reconnaissance missions, for example, as well. But everyone else fought really hard to, to get into it, but then also to get back 
um, many people do sort of several tours because they really enjoy they really enjoy taking part and doing it. Um, and again, it's just one of these fascinating, absolutely unique units that the British Army has and develops for a very particular place in a very particular time that's so important to the history. Uh, mm. And it was great to be able to, to not only learn more about that and speak to more people who've been involved, but to, to see more of the things in the collection. You know, the, yeah. the key that opened the T-64 tank. I mean, <laughs> I didn't even, you know, until I began who the project. Knew? Who knew? I mean, exactly. Knew? Uh, I found that in a box uh, yeah, just in the stores. And so that was brilliant to be able to bring that out too. Um, Steve Mason asks, and hi, Steve, thanks for tuning in. He says um, about Bricksmiths, he believes that the Soviets had a similar unit and did the US or French also have the same? And how was the Soviet version managed? So, um, yes, uh, is, is, is the simple answer to the first part of that question. There was a Soviet equivalent. It was called Soxmiths. Uh, it was based in Bunda in the British zone. Um, and their mission was essentially the same. They, they, they were tasked with going around and trying to find the British and trying to report back on, on their, their moves and motors as well. Although it turns out the majority of the time they could be found in the Nafi uh, in Hereford, um, stocking up on, 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 on gin and vodka, uh, it, it, which was the joke. But, you know, um, every British soldier was issued a, what was called a Soxmiss card. And we've got one in the exhibition. I was going to say, yeah. And it basically it says this is what a Soxmiss card number plate looks like this is how the, the you know this is what you should look out for if you see one of these call the, the royal military police in hereford and let them know so essentially we can come and box them in and, and stop them finding out and gathering intelligence um and if you did uh, you got a little card in the post to thank you for for calling one in uh which is probably the only time the rmp have been that nice to people uh but uh, you know in, and these sorts of things were really very much part of it now obviously in, in berlin Back inside East Germany, the, the French also had a liaison mission and the Americans also had a liaison mission too. Um, and in fact, there's a, a, a Nicholson, Major Nicholson, um, who was one of the Americans. Uh, he's actually killed. Uh, he was killed in, uh, in, in 1985 um, on, a, on, on a reconnaissance gathering mission by, by East German forces. Um, and so, you know, when we talk about Bricksmith and the sense of dare and do, it was actually quite, it was pretty dangerous, yeah. you know. Um, and, and, you know, speaking to, I spoke to former chiefs of the mission, former operatives with it. And, you know, there was a hierarchy of, you know, of how quickly people would be likely to shoot at you. These Germans apparently were very quick to shoot. Um, and yet, then there was a Stasi campaign, you know, Stasi plans to actually try and ca cause deliberate traffic accidents and all this sort of stuff. So while they had sort of this quasi diplomatic status, it was still very dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that shouldn't really be overlooked when we talk about some of this stuff. No, completely. And actually, we do have a talk um, going into a bit more detail on Bricksmiths on the 19th of March. Um, so do have a look on the National Army Museum website, or I'm sure we'll post a link um, to that talk as well. So you can all sign up and, and join in. Just before I move on to the question, someone's um, Crawford's put a comment in the chat saying there's no mention of the last military train. Do you know anything about that? The, the British military train, I can assure you, it is in the exhibition. Uh, absolutely. I mean, how could you not talk about the British oh, Well, exactly. Train, you know, that ran every day apart from Christmas Day and the Berlin blockade. Um, absolutely fantastic. You know, this way of getting in and out of Berlin, you know. Um, yes, some people flew in. Some people went up the road corridor um, through, you know, Checkpoint Alpha, Brava and then Charlie, um, which would take you into to East Berlin itself. Um, but, you know, the Berlin military train was the major way that people got up there. And, you know, the sense of ritual that came with it, of marching up and down the platform, changing the engine, uh, at Marienburg and, and all this sort of stuff, pulling into Brandenburg uh, and, Pot, um, and Potsdam, uh, rather pulling into a sort of Potsdam at, at, at you know high tea time and being able to to, to eat at this delicious meal in the dining car and look out on, on the East German commuters uh, struggling under communism. You know these these these, these small relatively petty ideological victories. We uh, uh, talk about the train in the next tour that's airing on the 18th of March. So you all have to tune in to, to the third and final part of our exhibition tours. Exactly. To, to, come to back learn to it more. Because, um, because the Berlin, I mean, I know, but it's a, it's a good it point because the Berlin is. military train was absolutely part and parcel of the fabric of life. Um, and it was a real Cold War icon. And, you know, it's something I talk about in the book. It's something we've got in the exhibition. Um, uh, and yeah, it's, it, that, was a, that was a really fun thing to, to find. I actually found a working model of the train in our stores as well. Someone built a model of it That's and painted all the cars in the right livery, the dining car. All, um, they painted the, because um, uh, the, it's Royal Corps of Transport that, that, that was responsible for it as well. Uh, and the Berlin Brigade flash was all painted on it as well. It's fantastic. Oh, our collection is just incredible. Um, from Robin and uh, 
he asks, did X Lionheart have a real impact on the Cold War? And did the Soviets recognize it as having an impact? Yeah, again, another great question. So, because obviously the point of these exercises and the uh, uh, Crusader um, uh, 80 and Lionheart 84, you know, they begin to mark a bit of a change in what the British are doing. You know, by this point, Bagnall was moved into into command and he sort of reformulated a lot of this doctrine and in fact that this is going to be a battle that not only the British are going to fight but they're going to win and they're going to do it by fighting the deep battle through manoeuvre um, and he's really changed the mindset of this and Lionheart was a lot about that um, and and it was a it was an exercise both to, both to basically train and test the British but also to showcase their ability as well you know it, it was designed to be very visible uh, to the Soviets and, and not necessarily to intimidate them but to show them that the British were both serious about fighting, but also capable of doing so too. Uh, and, you know, things like re the reforger exercises or return of forces to Germany, uh, which is what the, the, it basically stands for, that the Americans used to run as well. All of these were very much part and parcel of what training was like. It was designed for, for an audience because that's what deterrence is. You know, yes, there's the secret stuff that you do, but there's also the big, the big showcase stuff too, because, you know, d deterrence is about uh, a credible essentially a credible threat uh, mm. and the exercises were really important in that and you know the people realized that how important these exercises were and how significant they were and the, and the sheer scale of them um and i think that really translated into into why they ran and in fact actually later in the in, in the 80s even before the collapse of the of, of, of the of the soviet union and the opening of the wall um there are russian observers on some of these exercises um and who come and look at it and again it's it's sort of designed as a these are ways in which we can manage tensions between the, the conflicts of the superpowers but at the same time this is also a way in which we can show you what we can do to make you maybe think twice mm. about how easily the uh, the third soviet shock army might roll its way to calais um robin asks on youtube what do you know of neo and the plans to evacuate families in the face of the invasion I think he might have wrote the plans and has said that he might email us. Um, but do you know anything about that? Yeah. So on the, on the one hand, great, please do. That'd be fantastic to learn about. Um, on the other, yes, there were these, these non-evacuation orders um, and plans about how to move uh, in particularly the, the families and relatives out of, of, of Germany in the threat. The problem of course being that from the fifties onwards, once the war went nuclear, mm. you know, if, if, places like Rheindahlen, for example, JHQ, we're going to have been targeted straight away. Um, and then the massive military community there is, is going to, have, we would have gone with it. Um, and so whilst some of these things were practiced, and it's quite funny, actually, I spoke to a lot of, I spoke to teachers um, and I spoke to, to, to people who've been children and school, and, and school pupils uh, and students in Germany at the time. And, and not all of them even remembered practicing any of these drills. Some of them sort of vaguely remembered that something might have been mentioned, but some of them don't even remember practicing them. And some of the teachers don't remember even being briefed in them either. So I think whilst they officially existed, their application very much depended on essentially the, the, the garrisons um, and how seriously people took it within them and how fatalistic they approached the idea. Um, I know for a fact there were some people who, who deliberately kept you know, a stash of petrol in their garage so that if something should happen they'd just jump in their car and drive um and, and and drive westwards and try and get back to the channel ports ahead of whatever was coming behind them mm. um so it was always serious and there was always a plan but there was sort of this mixture of official plan versus people's personal plans but look i'd love to hear more about it um so please yeah. do get in touch i think it goes back to what we were saying earlier especially before we came on i don't think that we and people realised that how that nuclear threat was quite real and, you know, living amongst that. And that's really interesting to hear about, you know, them not actually remembering some of those things because it was just probably a part of their everyday, day-to-day -day life. Um, oh, the train... I was told that the brigade was mobilised and moved to the border when the military train was deliberately delayed by the Soviets after they allowed a refugee, refugee on board. Was that true? Occasionally, yeah. So occasionally yeah. The, the, the train could be a sort of a, a flashpoint and a, and a point of tension because obviously it had to cross uh, Soviet-controlled territory. And in fact, in one of the objects we've got in the uh, exhibition, which you can find online as well on our website, is there's a leaflet that shows you the route of the military train. And on it, they actually pinpoint and say, well, look, you can, this is a Soviet gunnery range. You can often see Soviet troops exercising here, all this sort of stuff. They actually showed people in where they were in East Germany, what they could see as points of interest, mm. liven it up. 
and it was just normal and that was one of the most fascinating things i found about this whole experience of working on this project was was what, how normal adjusted you know we talk a lot now in, in the current year about what the new normal is uh versus the old normal and it was fascinating to learn what the, what the accepted norms were in the cold war particularly when you're moving from places like berlin uh, and you're crossing the, the international borders completely um Someone was put on YouTube, good day, was in Osnabrück from 1980 to 1984. Would you know or be able to point me in the direction for research on what Gudrun Himmler's role was in West German intelligence in 1961? Yeah, so there's some interesting stuff about this. Um, there's a lot of sort of myth and controversy and versus you know, the actual real history of it as well. Um, there's some there's some good stuff written about it. It's not something that I exclusively looked at um, because the sort of what the BND were, were, were working on and, and the, the German counterintelligence and stuff was, was a bit beyond the remit of, of what I was looking at with the army. But, but how they, obviously they are interacting and, and there is this, you know, what there is this intelligence battle taking place. Um, there are, you know, there's the Teufelsberg in Berlin, uh, the famous listening tower where the, a, a lot of people, where guys in the signals were based and that sort of thing and the intelligence company were based as well. Um, and there were some great, there's some great stories about guys who, uh, who worked in the signals who, um, they get called, they get sick, they get basically calls at Christmas from the Russians, um, mm. all address them individually by name, <laughs> uh, say Merry Christmas and stuff like that. So it's quite funny about how much was being able to be picked up from, from each side, let alone all some of the, the more subversive elements and the propaganda that's being pushed across. Yeah. Um, Rory Cormack, who spoke on, a, on our oh, public programme, uh, has worked on some of this stuff, which is really good. And in fact, you might be able to find that in the museum's back catalogue on Crowdcast. So. Yeah, someone mentioned um, in the chat as well that they had just reading his book, Disrupt and Deny, and Mike's put, I'm currently reading the book from the lecture last year. It's a really interesting read. So, Isabel, I don't know if you're able to put um, a link to that one from the back catalogue so that people can go and watch Peter and Rory talking. I think that was one of my favourites. Um, not that I should have favourites, but it's just a fascinating, fascinating talk from last year. Um, there's another question that's come in um, from Ewan, who says, once Hess died, did the Soviets remain in Spandau or did his death weaken the foothold in West Berlin? Um, working at the BMH, I remember how much pandemonium his admissions would cause. Yeah, so obviously, sort of the the, the governance of Spandau Prison, where the the sort of the, the Nazis uh, were, were were held, and Hess being the, the most famous and the, the last one, was a, a major sort of quad pro, um, quad partite, you know, thing responsibility for all of the, the occupying powers of Berlin, and it's something that sort of pervades past the, the Cold War, and it's amazing. There's this idea, there's this fact that just because the reason we're fighting a war doesn't mean we can't be civil to each other. And they would do this and the British would maintain access to Spandau, which fell into their, their zone of occupation for the Russians to come in and do it. Um, after Hess dies, they actually, um, to prevent Spandau becoming sort of a Nazi shrine, they bulldoze it to the ground uh, and they build a massive entertainment complex on it. They build a naffy and a cinema uh, on top of it. Um, uh, and it's so it doesn't exist anymore uh, and mm. it's gone relatively quickly and that actually I mean the, the, the army put quite a lot of money into that um, and it happens re pretty quickly before the end of the the, the the opening of the wall and the and the withdrawal of the British from Berlin but I mean that, that in itself is really what overtakes things but then at the same time you know the, so there's, the Soviet war memorial in the Tiergarten is still there and the British still maintain access to that for the you know they still facilitate access to the Soviets for that for their guards of honours, for their various parades, um, you know, the 50th anniversary uh, of the end of the Great Patriotic War, which happens after this as well, is, is the, the, the Russians are brought back in. But previous uh, iterations of that had taken place too. Um, and similarly, the British had actually protected that monument from vandalism from the West Berliners. The West Berliners used to, you know, throw stuff at that, um, try and vandalise it, graffiti it. And the, the British used to guard it as well. And they put up scaffolding around it and all this sort of thing to... Uh, to, to protect it so you know they were, because obviously this was part of the ideological battle of the cold mm. war they couldn't be seen the british couldn't be seen on the international stage to be not uh, ultimately occupying the moral high ground uh, and so they made so all of these things that were signed when they were still allies all of these agreements that were put in place things exactly like bricksmiths are all maintained um even if they start to devolve, uh, evolve into sort of subsidiary uh, purposes and this sort of stuff mm. I think something you just touched on and a question that's come in from Facebook is how big roughly is the resident force now in Germany? 
Yeah, and it's those graphics on the wall. So do all come and see the exhibition when we reopen. Um, it will be uh, staying in on in the museum for um, for a little longer now, won't it? So you'll be able to come and and have a look and and see it on display. And it's that those graphics that really do show that picture of that scale of the decrease. Yeah, and I think you know what Germany is. I mean, the army has when we began the project, the army was completely leaving Germany. That was what was was happening. The army was completely getting out of Germany, um, and actually, what we've got, what's happened now, is they they, they reevaluated it. They, 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 they some political decisions have been made to, to change and retain the training area in Senelaga. Um, and so that's where the that's where the British are still based. Um, that's where they still are. Hello to anyone who is actually tuning in uh, from 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 British Army Germany now as well. Uh, see, we haven't forgotten you guys. No. Uh, and you know this is a really important part of going forward this is the next stage and it's what what's really interesting actually is um uh the uh guys have been there um working up to get ready to go out on cabrit and this sort of stuff as well it's really important for for, for training purposes um and they're starting to refer to germany as the launch pad again to move on and, and go elsewhere in the world which is exactly what it the, 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 the exactly the phase it became after the end of the cold war you know, with, with things like Granby and then, and then yeah. and Grapple in the Balkans, um, uh, Kosovo, obviously, as well, um, before Iraq and, and, and Telic and, 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 and Herrick in Afghanistan. So, you know, the army's, the army's still in Germany and will still stay in Germany uh, in, this new, in this new part and this new relationship between the, between the two countries. Um, and it continues to be a really crucial training area uh, for the British where they can just do things you just can't, you just can't really replicate anywhere else here in the UK. Yeah, I completely agree. Do you have any final remarks um, that you'd like to say before we finish the tour? Uh, only just that I think it's fantastic uh, to have an opportunity to talk about this. Thank you so much to everybody for, for tuning in and listening. Um, as, as you can probably imagine, purely from a personal perspective, put on this exhibition and not having anyone be able to come and see it, it's been pretty disappointing. Uh, so uh, it's, been delight it's been absolutely delightful for me to be able to talk about it uh, and, and bring it to you at home. And, you know, we, we are going to have the, the, the museum the exhibition is still in the museum when we reopen and it will have an extended run. So there will still be time for you to come and see it. Um, and we'd love you to do so. And we'd love you, if you've got stories of Germany, you know, if yeah. any of this stuff resonates with any of you, we'd love you to come into the museum, walk around the exhibition and share them with us. Because, you know, for us, the, the, the past is a living place. Um, and we constantly like to, 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 to touch, uh, you know, touch back to that and hear how it continues to shape people in the present. Completely. Um, and Peter has uh, written a book on the subject called um, The British Forces in Germany, The Lived Experience, which you can find on our shop. And I'm sure there's a link accessible um, we'll be sharing in the chats. So do um, head on to the National Army Museum's website and do purchase a copy if you'd like to learn and read more in this time where we can't bring you um, into the exhibition physically. Um, but thank you everyone for watching this uh, special virtual tour of the exhibition. The next in installment is all about family life in Germany, which I'm sure will touch a personal call with lots of you um, that served in Germany and spent lots of your time. Oh, I don't know whether that's one of my favourite tours. That's a, that's a pretty good one, though. And that's airing on the 18th of March, at, again, at 12pm. But thank you so much, Peter. I mean, I never tire of listening to you and all of your knowledge and research that you've put into this. It's absolutely phenom phenomenal. And that's what lots of people are saying in the chat. Just, you know, thank you so much for, for giving up your time and for sharing this with us. Um, everyone, we hope to welcome you back to the museum once we can reopen. Um, later in um, May, fingers crossed, um, if the government's plans all go well, and we look forward to seeing you. But until then, please keep supporting the National Army Museum um, by turning up to our virtual events. Tomorrow, we have a talk um, about Granby, which Peter will be hosting. So we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you. Thanks very much, Roy. Bye.